You're listening to the Frantic Filmmaker Podcast. Hello, Tom. Thank you very much for joining the podcast. I really appreciate your time. Would you like to quickly introduce yourself and just give some background? Oh, sure. Well, well thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Tom McLaren, and I live in Los Angeles. I'm LA-based, and I've been working in the entertainment industry my whole life. I started on the business side, but I switched over to the creative side about eight or nine years ago. So now I'm, I'm a working actor and uh, I'm also a published author and I'm a new producer. So I've got my hats in, in various areas, but that's my new life. And I understand that you didn't, you start the acting much later in life. Would you better just explain that journey a little bit? Yes, I, uh, I did a uh, late in life career change, a, a drastic career change. Um, I know most people, when they want to be an actor, they start, you know, age 20 or even age 30, but I didn't do that. <laughs> I, um, when I was young, I didn't really think I was going to act at all. My whole life had been geared towards business. And so whether it was high school or college, uh, everything was going down that path. I, I went to the University of Michigan and I got a BBA, a Bachelor's in Business Administration. A couple of years later, I went to Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, and I got an MBA in accounting. So that's the path I was down. Um, so I was trained for it, experienced in it, educated for it. And, and so I started as a corporate businessman and I did it for about 20 years and uh, it was good for me. It was good to me. Uh, but I would say as a whole, I, I was basically not happy enough. I thought this is not the profession that I want to be in my entire life. I don't want to be that 70 year old man kind of, you know, struggling into the office and you know, angry and unhappy and bitter. And I don't want to be that person. So I kind of recognized early on that I, that I didn't want to do it my entire life. But, but when you become a businessman, you go into this rut and it's very hard to get out of that rut. Um, as a businessman, you're kind of put into a box. And, and you do this function and you can do it for 50 years, you can do it for your whole life. And when you're in that path, it's hard to get off of that path. So what I realized as I got into middle age was um, I needed to make a change. And so I ultimately just flat out quit my job. I had been working at Warner Brothers for many years. I worked at Warner Brothers for about 16 years as a businessman. And I quit that job and um, I thought, okay, it's time for something different. Now, for a couple of years, I struggled. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I knew I was too young to completely retire, and I had to find something to do. And it was at that point where I realized I had, I had nurtured the, the intellectual side of my brain my entire young adult life. That's really what it was all about. It was being analytical and problem-solving and detail-oriented and all those things. And I realized I had never nurtured the creative side of my brain. I had never done anything like that. So I thought it's kind of now or never. If I, if I don't try it now, I'll have regrets later in life. And you don't want to be an old man with major regrets. So there was a key moment. It was uh, in 2011. I remember it vividly. My, my wife, Mary, who um, was working in business and enjoyed her job, she was working late that night. And I sat there with my laptop and I, I Googled acting classes San Fernando Valley. And I found a class that was in Burbank starting in a, a week or two. I called them the next day and boom. Uh, on October 3rd, 2011, I walked into my very first acting class and I had no acting experience whatsoever. I did not do it in high school, college, community theater, nothing. So I walked in utterly terrified, sweating, and I didn't really know whether I was going to like it even. It was a kind of experiment. Initially, you know, I didn't tell anyone except my wife. She was the only one who knew because I considered it to be kind of a risky experiment. But to make a long story short, I think in that first month of the acting class, I, I, I figured out there was something there for me. It was worth investigating further. It was worth pursuing. So I stayed and uh, I ended up in the second class and I got my first commercial agent very fast. I ended up on the audition circuit very fast. And I think it was my fourth or fifth audition and I, I booked a Toyota web commercial and that's how I officially launched. That was February of 2012. And so it just kind of became a speeding train from that point forward. And, and it is my full-time focus. It's my full-time profession now. Why acting and not something else like writing? 
That's a good question. I, I've been asked that by a lot of uh, family and friends, and there's no one answer to it. It's, it's a long and complicated story. I, there's so many paths I can go down to ex- try to explain it. I, I think I felt, you know, as a businessman that I was definitely boxed in, and I felt that I was capable of doing more than what I was being given. You know, when you're a businessman, you have this, you know, like I said earlier, this kind of function that you do, and you might deviate from it somewhat, but, but basically you can stay in, you know, a single job your entire career if you want. And, you know, you don't get the variety, you don't get the versatility. And the thing about going into acting or anything that's within entertainment is it's, it's project oriented. So you get to try different things with different people. And I knew I was capable of more and I needed some outlet to kind of prove that to myself. So being an actor is a perfect thing because one of the best parts of being an actor, one of the most fun parts is that you get to be people that you're not. You can, you can be a psycho killer. <laughs> you can be anything you know, that you're lucky enough to get the part to do. So you get to kind of explore other sides of your personality. And there is a, you know, there's a lot of stress and a lot of work and a lot of business associated with acting. But the, the fun part is actually yeah, kind of exploring like who you are and what you're capable of and trying different things. So I think that's really the primary reason was to kind of get out of my box and just kind of see what am I capable of? So for someone who maybe mirrored your experience or maybe even younger in their twenties, who isn't doing a creative role that they probably do dream to do, but they're too scared to do it. Is right. there any key takeaway piece of advice that you can now provide because of your own journey? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I'm very sympathetic to, to the younger people who want to do this because it's, it's, a, it's a tough profession for many reasons. And to be a 20-year-old who wants to pursue acting, it's, uh, it's a hard road to take. Um, one of the advantages of, of doing it later in life, certainly, is that I was able to uh, kind of plan for the future and prepare for the future. Uh, my wife and I have always been very good at long-term financial planning. So one of the advantages of being a middle-aged person was that we were kind of set and I could kind of um, do it without that kind of financial stress. Because it's very hard to be a 20-something and um, you, know, you want to be an actor, but you know, you've got to still make money and pay the rent. So you've got to juggle all these things. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's a hard path to be a starving actor. And I, I, as I said, I'm very sympathetic to the people who, who, who work that way. It's a hard life. Um, but in terms of yeah, advice for them, uh, I think you know, you know deep down what you really want to do, and you should always pursue your passion. Um, you've got to find the right time in your life to do it, and maybe it is at age 20, or maybe it's at age 40, or maybe it's at age 60. So if you've got something deep down at your core, you know, don't hide it away. Do go for it. Um, you've just got to find the right time to basically do that. And there's certain steps that you should do, regardless of your age, if you want to be an actor, there's certain things that you should, you should do, like going to acting classes and such. There's certain essential steps that I believe are necessary. And you mentioned you worked at um, Warner. Yes. A lot of people who aren't in the industry would assume that that would have given you a door or some connections or something. But you told me you could. <laughs> could you ex- help me understand that a little? Because... That's yeah, great. I found that fascinating to hear. Yes, I know. I've, I've got that question a few times from, from various people. And it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, uh, it doesn't really work like that. That's the funny thing. Um, there's a definite separation between business and creative. Um, when I was there, I worked primarily in the accounting finance function. I was the director of budgeting for the studio operations division at the Warner Brothers uh, lot in Burbank. So I, I, I worked with production, but I was not in production. Um, so you, you, you tend to overlap with other divisions and other functions of the studio, but everyone is so isolated in, in their particular division that it's, it's, it's very hard to cross over. I mean, but I will, you know, to kind of answer your question better perhaps, um, and I saw this uh, at Warner, and, and my wife worked at 20th Century Fox for her entire adult life. A lot of people will start at the studios and they work as assistants or coordinators. And and the majority of them are writers. So they're kind of there at the studio because they think it's their entry into um, a creative field. 
So they, they kind of pay their dues and they hope to make contacts. And I've, I've seen it work um, and I've seen it not work. So it kind of depends on who you are, who you're working with, who you overlap with. Um, but a lot of people do kind of take those entry level jobs with the thought that it'll help them bounce forward. Unfortunately, when I was at Warner Brothers, I had no idea that I was going to be an actor. None. Absolutely none. So I never tried to make any connections in that front. So um, I may have uh, wasted a little bit of time and effort by, uh, by, by knowing what I know now, but I didn't know it back then. Um, but I think it would have been hard. Um, you know, if you, if you want to go into um, entertainment and you want to go into producing, directing, writing, acting, post-production, special effects, whatever you want to go into, there is a basic kind of training ground that you have to go through. And it's very difficult to just, you know, automatically go from one field or profession to another. Usually you've got to pay your dues some way, somehow. There's exceptions to that rule, of course. Um, there's always the importance of connections and nepotism. It is Hollywood, after all. So sometimes if you've got someone who can give you a leg up and you can get an entry level in, in post-production and, and then you can work your way up through post-production. Um, and that certainly happens in acting an awful lot as well. But, but for the average person, hard to translate from business to acting. Uh, it's hard. <laughs> and I guess at that stage, starting young would benefit you, even though you don't have the experience because you've just got more time to kill and you've got more time to make mistakes and more time to... Or just fumble around, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I look back at my life and, and I think it, it did happen in a certain order for a certain reason. And I think it was kind of essential that it played out that way. If I could go back in time, I, I wouldn't be an actor at age 20 or 30. I, I, it wasn't the right thing for me when I was, when I was that age. I think, um, you know, my life experiences and my maturity and, and all this stuff kind of got me to where I was. And, so when it happened to me in midlife, um, that's when I was really ready for it. And, and I was better prepared in many respects. I mean, we'll probably talk about this a, more, a little bit more uh, later, but I knew an awful lot about entertainment because I had worked on the business side of it. So the issues of rejection and um, jealousy and various things, I mean, I, I knew an awful lot about this before I started acting. And so I had a pretty... Uh, what as a businessman I would call a realistic job preview. I, I pretty much knew what to expect. Now, when you actually get into it, there are, you know, things that, you, that do surprise you, things that you don't anticipate, but there is a certain kind of path that you have to kind of go down. And, and so, yeah, if I, if I could go back, I wouldn't really change, you know, the major decisions in my life. I would do it the way I, I, I've kind of done it. It sounds like that. Um, the, the lack of the financial pressure on you really did free you up mentally too oh, yes. to be able to perform without worrying if I don't get this role I can't pay my rent or something like that absolutely I mean uh, it's it's the nature of the business ups and downs you can't guarantee that uh, when the next job is going to come along so if, you, if you're doing it to pay your rent you're taking a big risk if you're doing it to get health insurance over here with SAG-AFTRA that's a big risk. You know, you've got to make a certain amount of money in a certain period of time to qualify for health insurance. So if you're in that path, it's, it's hard. Um, I'm very lucky and very fortunate and I'm very grateful for what's happened to me. Uh, uh, the most important thing in my life is my marriage to my wife, Mary. She's a wonderful person. And if, if I didn't have business or acting, I, Mary's what my life is really all about. But from, to kind of answer your question more directly, um, being in a two income family, was a, was a tremendous bonus. And Mary worked at 20th Century Fox for, as I said, her entire adult life. And she was happy in her business job. She enjoyed it. So we always had that stability to fall back on. So I may have been unhappy at Warner Brothers most of the time, but she was always happy at Fox all the time. So we, we were able to kind of, like I say, plan for the future and, and do things in a certain order. And, and now, which we'll talk about later, you know, Mary and I, you know, we're going to get to work together on, on future yeah. projects. So it, it all, you know, it's weird when I think about it that um, some of the things just happened wonderfully. I mean, to give you one little example, I, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Illinois and Michigan here in the United States. And uh, um, I ended up getting a, a job um, at CBS Fox Video, which was originally Michigan based. That's where my, my wife worked. And CBS Fox video transferred to the East Coast. So we ended up, ended up working in New York City for a while. And then they were going to basically move the operation to Los Angeles. 
So we came out here and CBS Fox became Fox. And, and so my wife got umbrellaed into the whole, the whole thing. And I ended up moving to Warner Brothers, obviously. But, but if I look at the luck that we both wanted to be in entertainment, we happened to find this company that was in Michigan. It was the home video industry back at the time. It was actually Michigan based. It wasn't LA or New York. And that went from the Midwest to the East Coast to the West Coast. And we were able to just follow it along and we ended up out here. I mean, we're so lucky when I, when I actually say it out loud. It's, it's amazing. So would you recommend moving to LA for a lot of aspiring actors if you're in America and you have the means? Uh, yes, I, I don't know a tremendous amount about the, the British film industry, to be honest. So I can't, I can't speak to that. But if you, if you want to, to, to work in the United States, certainly um, Los Angeles and New York are the best places to be. There are, there are other places you can live, which I would say kind of temporarily. It depends on the tax credits. There are often certain states or certain cities that are particularly hot at the moment. Like New Orleans was very hot for a while. But when the tax credits shift from one place to another, then, then that area is no longer hot. But what, what, I'll, what, I'll, what I can say you know, as an actor is, um, you know, a lot of production has moved out of Los Angeles. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's across the country, it's out of the country, it's in Canada, it's in Australia, it's everywhere. And so until, you, until and if you, you reach that 1% of the union that, that becomes like an A-list name actor, the rest of us who are trying to get a job, it's, it's a harder path to take because if a TV series is shooting in New Orleans, they will bring the lead actors to New Orleans, certainly. And they'll bring, you know, some key guest stars, you know, lead guest stars to, to New Orleans to shoot. But the other parts, the smaller parts, the smaller guest parts, the co-star parts, certainly the one and two day parts, they don't want to spend the money to ship you from LA to New Orleans. So they will hire locally. So there's a lot of factors you have to deal with as an actor about why you did or did not get a job. And local production is one of them. So the fact that production is, is, is running away, it's, it's been doing this for decades. I mean, Canada was one of the first places that it really ran away too. The fact that there's so little in LA is a challenge for an actor. But still, um, overall, if I had to choose you know, one or two cities, certainly New York and LA are the two places to be because this is where the major agencies are. This is where the major networks, major studios. So it may be a, an uphill battle to get into that inner circle, but at least you're in the right place so that you can, you know, you can hopefully make connections and you can certainly start to work. Um, you know, I started as an actor really with no connections whatsoever. I'd been a businessman, but as I said earlier, it didn't help me because I, I didn't know I was going to be an actor. I'm not sure it would have helped me if I knew I was going to be an actor. So that, that was, my, my Warner Brothers history was actually irrelevant to me being an actor. It did nothing for me to help me. But being here in L.A., I mean, I was basically able to, to, to follow the right path and take the right route and, and find the acting classes and find the agent and, and, and get independent, low-budget independent work, get commercials. So I was able to build my resume and really build my career here. In the first few years, certainly I didn't have anything that was network or studio related. It was all, all independent stuff, but, but it was perfect for me. It's, it's, you know, it's your experience, it's your training ground, it's building your resume. It's everything is one step that leads to the next step. So in some respects, you've got to pay your dues and, and, and you can certainly do that in LA and New York, I'm sure as well. I, I never, I worked in New York briefly, um, at, at CBS Fox, but once again, I, I didn't know I was going to go into entertainment, so uh, I was just a businessman in Rockefeller Center. And, but I think, yeah, New York certainly is known for its theater, but they've also got some, some film and television production as well. But it's, yeah, it's a big theater town. Yeah, that's what the impression I've got of that too. And um, there's one thing I was like asking, you mentioned you've done indie films or TV or whatever, and you've yes. also, I know that you've also been in bigger productions, so Lost in Space or Netflix, for instance. What are some yes. major differences between, uh, f from the acting perspective, a bigger production and a smaller production? Yes, I, I've, I've done both. I've done more of the low budget indie stuff than I have the, the big budget stuff, certainly. Um, I do prefer the big budget stuff, definitely. Um, 
which is not to say, listen, I've had some wonderful experiences on low budget independent films. I've worked with some wonderful filmmakers. Um, I would not trade those experiences for anything because they've been, they were perfect for me. But I've also had the opposite on the low budget indies. I've had some not so good experiences. So given the choice, I prefer the big budget because the people that are involved in those productions are professional, prepared, present. There's a lot of money at stake. So you have to know your job. You have to be good at your job because you know, every minute the clock's ticking and time is money. So if, if you're the flat tire on that car, you're gonna be fired. So when you're on a big budget TV show or, or movie, um, everyone's at the top of their game and it is fast paced, it is stressful, but I, I love working with talented professional people. And from my experiences so far, when you're on those sets, I mean, everyone's pretty much you know, running their A game and that's a wonderful environment to be in. On the low budget indie side, you kind of, you get what you get. Like I said, I've had some great experiences and I've had some not so great experiences. The trouble with the low budget indies is um, it's hard to say what everyone's motivation is for, for doing like a low budget indie film. I mean, someone may be doing a passion project. They really only intend to do one movie in their entire life, their one passion project. Maybe they surround themselves with um, family and friends to fill out the cast and crew. And so you've got people who are not necessarily professional. And I'll give you one example, a perfect example of this. I did a, I did a little cameo in an independent film last year. It was a filmmaker that I had worked for previously. So I was thrilled that he remembered me and brought me back. And I just came in to do a one day cameo for him. And this is a low budget indie. And um, we're shooting this, I'm in one scene, we're shooting this scene. And the production assistants, the PAs are over at the craft services table. And during the take, they're opening bags of chips. They're talking, they're dropping things. We ruined probably four or five takes just because the PAs were over there misbehaving. And I know the PAs were friends of the filmmaker. And I thought, oh boy, you know, it, it is the director's responsibility to basically take control of the set. And there is a risk if you're kind of just bringing in your pal to do something, a grip job or whatever it is, and it may or may not work out, and and it can cause problems. And you know, when you're when you're doing the low budget indies, you know, every take does count. <laughs> you're you're running out of time and money potentially. So so if something gets ruined for the wrong reasons, it's such a disappointment. So you kind of you kind of get what you get, but um, but it's it's an essential part of the business. There there's a lot more work to be had in the low budget independent arena than there is in the other areas. If you wanna work for networks and studios, you know, it's, it's, it's an uphill battle to get into those projects. You need to have a top tier agent. Um, everybody's competing for those jobs. And you know, without connections, it's very, very hard. So ho hopefully you can do both categories. Um, I think they're both essential. I love working in both, but given the choice, I think, yeah, most of us would probably prefer to be on like a set like Lost in Space because that's like heavenly. That's the dream, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And on the indie sets, I just want to focus on those for a bit. The, the directors themselves, how do they usually direct actors in your experience? Can you tell they're not as established? Yes. I mean, once again, I've worked with some great directors and I've worked with some not so great directors on this front. Um, the not so great ones on these low budget indies, sometimes they're basically just concerned about getting the shot. They just, you know, they're almost like, you know, DPs, cameramen, you know, director of photography. They're really just concerned about getting the shot and, and they don't communicate with the actors. So they're really just kind of get in, get it and get out. So I've worked with a few of those and um, you kind of learn to, to self-direct yourself <laughs> self-critique yourself because you're not getting any feedback from the director. Uh, the better sets to be on, the better filmmakers to work with are, are the ones that actually do work with the actors and communicate with them and give them the feedback. You know, as actors, we, we really want to hear the feedback. You have to have the right temperament for this because you've got to be able to take positive and negative feedback. You've got to be able to take notes and you've got to be able to adjust immediately to what they say. So there is a skill set to that. And you've got to have the right personality to not be too sensitive and to take it properly and absorb it. 
Um, so it's not for everyone, certainly. But um, most actors, I think, we love to get the feedback. And if a director is willing to work with us and explain more to us about the character and who we're, who we're in the scene with and what the, what the setting is, that's a joy when that happens. Now, in my experience, it doesn't happen all the time on the endings of these sets. Um, sometimes you get these jobs and they don't say anything to you about your character. Um, I've done, I mean, feature films, I've done a lot of supporting parts um, in feature films. I've been in, I've been in 30 films in total now. And, uh, and sometimes I think uh, the director kind of, they, they ignore the supporting parts somewhat. Uh, maybe they're just more focused on the leads and, and so they don't work with the supporting people as much. That, that may be the view that I'm getting. But I think that's a shame because when you look back at um, certain movies and certain TV shows, a supporting actor can be very, very important. If, and, and the TV shows, I mean, everyone has seen, um, you know, uh, Friends and Murphy Brown and Cheers, and you see how important the ensemble is. Every person is important in that cast. You've got George Went in Cheers sitting on the bar stool. It's a smaller part, but he's a key part of that show. And so I think directors should recognize that no matter what it is, whether it's one line or a lead, they're important to your project. You don't want any weak links. And so work with them. That, that's, that's all I can say. I, I know we're all subject to, to time constraints and everybody's you know, got all you know, these things that they're multitasking through. It's, it's a hard job to be a director and, and a hands-on producer because you're there and you've got to solve any problem and every problem. And you've got to you know, deal with light, sound, airplane noise car noise, um, extras. <laughs> You've got to deal with all these factors. Um, there was a movie that I was on, uh, which was a bigger, a bigger budget movie. It's kind of a modified middle, middle category movie. And uh, I was there um, on, on the very last day. And, uh, and, I, and the, the producer had to deal with exploding toilets. Now, there's more important things to deal with, right? Because we're trying to shoot a movie. But there's exploding toilets. So that's their problem, too. So. Yeah, if you're going to go into uh, behind the camera stuff, you've got to be a multitasker. And if you're an on-camera actor, you have to learn to block out the noise. That's one of your jobs as an actor, in my opinion, is you know, no matter what's going on, you've got to block out the noise around you and focus on your job. So maybe the director is not getting along with the lead actor. They're fighting for whatever reason. You've got to work around that. You've got to ignore it as best you can. You've got a job to do and don't let that influence you. So it's, um, it's a challenge. It's, it's harder than, than people think it is. I think everybody should try it at some point in their life because you get a different perspective. There's so many uh, armchair critics out there and they're, they're so quick to criticize you know, an actor or a director or a writer or whatever. And it's like, you know, it's a tougher job than you think. And you also have to keep in mind, um, especially from the actor's view, you know, we don't have any say over the final product. So what you see on the screen, uh, you may not like it, but you know what? We are subject to what the director told us, what the producer wanted, what the editor cut. So it's, it's out of my hands. It's out of, it's out of the actor's hands. Um, talking now back to bigger sets, what have you observed from the more established directors, say Lost on Space, because that's probably the biggest one you've been on, when they are interacting with the lead stars, how is, does that work? It's, it's, yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, I'll, I'll use Lost in Space as the example. So, uh, so I'm in one episode of um, season two, uh, which is on Netflix, obviously. And um, I'm, I'm, my episode was really focused, um, I, I worked with two actors. I worked with Ignacio Cericcio, who's a series regular who plays Don West and Sakina Jaffrey, who was a major recurring character in season two. She was Captain Kamal on the Resolute. So in my episode, I'm, I'm the second in command to Captain Kamal. So, so I get there on this massive soundstage in Vancouver, an A-list production beginning to end. I can't tell you how wonderful you get treated on a production like that. But you make it to the soundstage and you get on the, on the set and it's the Resolute. It's, for me, uh, I had a little geek moment because I'm excited I, I grew for up. you hearing this, by the way. Like hearing <laughs> it, I'm excited for you. Like it sounds I, amazing. I, I am a bit of a geek when it comes to this stuff because I grew up, you know, on reruns of the original Lost in Space, certainly, and Star Trek. So when I'm when I'm on the bridge of the Resolute, 
it's like being on the bridge of the enterprise. It's like, oh my God, this is so fun. I'm in a uniform and, oh God, it's just, it's just great. But you, you get there and um, yeah, it's all, it's all timed properly. Like they don't call you over till they're ready for you. You stay in your trailer until they're ready and you go into a holding area until they're ready. And then you get there. And so the director is working very closely with uh, Ignacio and, and Sakina in particular because they have most of the dialogue in the scene. So they have a little bit of rehearsal time where they basically block it and run through it. And so they're, they're, the three of them are communicating and I'm, I, I get to interject a little bit. I have, I have the smaller part, obviously, of all of them, but I kind of get to witness and watch you know, how these three people are interacting. And it's, it's so wonderful to see because they're, they're not just working on, on blocking movements and getting the shot. They're, they're, they're talking about the motivation behind what they're saying. You know, what is the intent? What is their point of view? So, you know, these are established actors, these, these two. And so they, they have um, you know, kind of an interactive conversation with the director. So it's not just him telling them what to do, it's them working with him. So it was this kind of collaborative effort between all three of them to basically get it down. And so when it comes time to shoot, um, everyone's got to be ready. Everyone's got to be focused. Everyone's got to be doing their jobs. So on a production like that, um, you do shoot it fast, but we do several takes and we do them with different lenses. So there's, you know, there's the establishing shot and there's the mid, there's the close up. So we actually shoot it several times. So you kind of get to play with it a little bit, but um, it was wonderful because even though I have, um, I have a co-star part in the episode, so I, I certainly have a you know, much smaller part than Ignacio is a series regular and Sakina is a major recurring, so they've got huge parts in this. So, um, but I was able to work with the director a little bit too because I had, I had a couple lines there and, um, and I thought, well, there's two ways I can deliver this line. And so I, I did ask the director, I said, you know, I can either do it this way or I can do it this way. And he's like, nope, you're gonna do it this way. So it was wonderful. He was very focused, very involved. And, uh, and, and he, he could, you know, answer the question immediately. And as an actor, that's what you want. You don't want to ask a director and have him go, hmm, I don't know, try it both ways. You know, you don't want that. You kind of want like, what do you see? Because in my opinion, it's always in the eye of the beholder. You know, as actors, you know, we, you may think you're wonderful at home. You may think you're wonderful when you're practicing in the mirror in isolation, but who knows, right? It's always in the eye of the beholder. So it doesn't matter what I think. I do have a gut feel whether I'm doing a good job or a bad job, but I don't know whether I'm really nailing it or not. That's for the director or producer to kind of work with me and tell me. So um, I think that's true whether you're in an acting class or whether you're doing a student film or whether you're on a professional set. Um, you do need that eye of the beholder to give you feedback. And that's, that's a, a very key part. Um, maybe some actors don't like that. They, they think that they know best, but I'm not of that mindset. I, I think I, I do welcome the feedback from the director in particular. And that goes back to what you said about indie sets where an independent director, you mentioned earlier about um, the director knowing the intent of the character. You said in the indie directors, they might be the, almost the DLP of their own movie. They just want the lines yes. done, if you know what I'm yeah. trying to say. Whereas in your experience, what I've gathered, you're saying the character intent and the scene intention. And un the, the director completely understands the dynamic of the scene. And he's focusing on that side. And it's, he doesn't, is that, is that, I've gathered that correctly. Yes. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's basically it. I mean, the director does have to, as I say, multitask. They, they've got to, do a lot of things, but they should have a good crew around them so that there, there is someone who, who is paying attention to the lighting and the sound and these other factors so that, so that the director can focus on what is really, you know, his primary job, which is to create, you know, a good entertaining product. So yeah. he has to be surrounded by good people so that he can, you know, make these big key decisions, but also pay attention to the details. Sometimes, you know, just a single line, the way it's delivered can change the tone of the scene. So you need a director who's kind of focused on that. So I've seen this happen in low budget indie, certainly. I mean, I've worked with some, some, some great people, but sometimes, you know, um, I, I did one film last year and, and it was really kind of a function of 
being you know out of time and money once again i'm there on the very very last day and we have a rented location with a firm out and we have to be out at 6 p.m or whatever it was and there's nothing we can do about that and we're, and we're shooting like key scenes and so suddenly the director has to make decisions on the spot and suddenly scenes get cut things get changed now was that the director's original vision i doubt it because it was in the script differently <laughs> but because we ran out of time and money something had to be done at you know 5 p.m that day because we have to be out at six and so you know that's unfortunate i think when that happens um you know my goal when uh I'm producing my own projects with my wife, Mary, is, uh, you know, always have, you know, en enough time and money to make the movie that you want to make. I don't want to ever have to, well, I mean, I, I understand it sometimes happens, but I don't want to have to make a creative decision uh, because of something like that. Now, stuff happens, you know, it does. I mean, something can, you know, like to toilets can explode. So, you know, maybe that scene has to be scrapped or whatever it is. So these things do occur, but it's a shame when the when it happens for the wrong reason. And if it's simply because, yeah, you rented a location that you, you, you couldn't get for like, you know, three more hours, that's a shame. You know, it's like you, you have to kind of, um, you know, certainly storyboard, you know, directors should always storyboard things. And and kind of plan it out and you realize everything is more complicated than you think everything's going to take longer than you think and so you have to build in i guess a cushion you've always got to have a cushion when you're you're, you're coming up with your budget for contingency right there's always got to be at least a 10 percent contingency for overages but i think a director's got to have a contingency as well in terms of what he's shooting and how he's shooting it because things go wrong things go awry oh boy happens all the time um on a slightly different note What's your advice for an actor who has done a lot of indie films, let's say, and now they have got a chance to act on a bigger set, a bigger production like you did, and suddenly they're on that set and they might be a bit awestruck by it. What's your advice there? Yeah, it's, that's, yeah, that's stress and nerves. That's, that's a hard one to deal with. Um, and that's why I think in some respects it is best to kind of go on, I guess, what I think is kind of a standard path. I mean, I think you should always start out um, with acting classes. Um, I preface that by saying, there's no acting teacher that's going to teach you to be a good actor, never. You have to have a core amount of talent inside you. An acting teacher can help to nurture it. They can help to fine tune your skills. And it's always good to get the practice um, but there's no acting teacher that's going to suddenly turn you from A to B. It's just not going to happen. But it's an essential step. Um, you learn a lot about yourself in that process. You can practice and make mistakes and it doesn't matter, right? So you definitely have to go through that path. You have to go up that path when you're starting because you learn so much. You learn helpful hints and techniques, things that you're, you're going to take with you to future sets so you know how to interact with other actors and you, you know how to work on your character and develop your character's backstory. So you should always start with that. Um, and then I encourage people yet, you know, maybe as your first steps towards actually working and getting out of class is, is you know, do student films, um, do low budget indies, do commercials, do anything you can get. The first two or three years I was acting, I turned down nothing. I accepted every job offer I got, no matter what it was, even some unpaid ones, because I knew it was good experience, I could get good footage out of it. Do everything you can, because the more experience you have under your belt, um, the more times you've been on set, this will all serve you well when you make it to a big budget set. Because the stakes are very high, it can be very intimidating. Um, sometimes if you know, I, I, I've never really worked with a name actor who's intimidated me, but I, I'm sure it does happen because they just don't have the patience for someone who, who may not know how to do a particular thing. Could I quickly interrupt so, there for a moment, sorry? That was actually going to lead into a question I really wanted to ask. Oh, yes, please. When you are working with these leading actors, the bigger actors on these sets, is there any etiquette or advice you would give someone who's never done it before? Hmm. Let me think about that. Uh, I've worked with, uh, with several name actors. Um, I guess, you know, I try to just act like a professional actor when I'm with them. 
So I sometimes regret after the fact that I didn't talk to them more about, about uh, you know, projects that I've seen them in. I, I, you don't want to come across as someone who's you know, too fanish, in, in my opinion. I mean, you want to come across as a professional actor because you're hired to be one and that's your job and you're there to do a job. So you don't want to, be, you don't want to go overboard, but I, I do kind of regret that I, I missed out on some of that with, it, uh, with some of the people that I've worked with. But in my experience, um, I've, I've only had good experiences with the name actors that I've worked with. And I know there's exceptions to this rule. We've all heard about these, right? Um, I've not encountered that kind of a-hole, a-lister, shall we say. It's not happened to me just yet. But, uh, but the people I've worked with, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll cite the, the two biggest budget movies that I've been on are The Exorcism of Molly Hartley with uh, Devin Sawa and Santa's Little Helper with Mike the Miz Mizan. And, and both of those guys, oh, they're so, they're so great. They're, they're so professional and they know their game and they know exactly what they're doing and they're good actors and they're genuinely nice people. That the first real set that I had been on at this time was, uh, was Exorcism of Molly Hartley. There were a lot of firsts for me on that movie. We shot it in the summer of 2014, and this is for Fox. And I'm in uh, Winnipeg, I'm in Canada for this one. And uh, I get there and it's, you know, it's my first SAG after movie. It's my first studio movie. It's the first time I've traveled for a movie. It's the first time I've been in a trailer, my own trailer, like my own trailer. And it's got like, you know, my own bathroom, and my own shower and all this stuff. I was stunned by the whole thing. And I get there to the set. And so, um, well, actually I met Devin at the hotel. We, we drove out to the location together, but, but Devin was so wonderful. He, he's such a great actor and you see his focus while he's working and, and it, it helps bring your game up because just being in his vicinity is like, it's, it's kind of awesome. And, 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 and you see how he works on a set and how the director works with him. And you learn a lot just from that process. So that was my first kind of big experience. And I guess I was scared. I was nervous, um, but I survived. And um, the only thing I do kind of regret after the fact that I, uh, I never really talked to Devin about, um, I was, I'm such a fan of the original Final Destination. He was the lead actor in that, if you remember. And Devin was so great in Final Destination. And I never asked him about it because I didn't want to look like that guy who's, you know. <laughs> but I do regret that I didn't talk to him about that. But listen, you know, he, you know, he, was, uh, he was a great guy. He was there. He was very focused on the work. And he had just had a baby. So when we weren't in the scene, he was, he was often Skyping home to his, his wife. And so I didn't want to intrude on the family time. And so, but, but, but the time I did spend with him was wonderful. He's a great guy. What's your advice for aspiring actors to deal with rejection and failure in the industry? Because it is an industry where you get knocked back quite a lot of times. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, see, for me, rejection is not the biggest issue because it's a given. I knew about it in, in advance. I say, if you're going to be an actor, you have to accept rejection you should go into it knowing you're going to be rejected. So you need to have that mindset up front. And then, it, and then in my mind, it's not the biggest issue to deal with. I mean, from, from a practical day-to-day -day perspective, it's a challenge, certainly. Um, I mean, one little thing that I do to protect myself is when I go in for an audition, I do the audition and I immediately forget about it. I assume I'm not going to get the job. If I get the email or the phone call a few days or a few weeks later, it's a happy surprise. Um, but I've moved on as best I can. Um, so sometimes when, I, when I've got these calls, uh, I don't even remember which one they're talking about. Like they'll, they'll assume that I remember exactly. You're like, you got the job. And, and I'm thinking like, okay, which, which job was this? Which audition was this? Because I, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. I kind of I kind of move on from it. So that's one thing that I kind of do to protect myself. It is a challenge. I'm no expert at it. Um, it gets hard in some respects because if it's something that goes, especially the network and studio stuff, it'll go through a very formal process generally, most of the time, and you'll get an audition and you'll have a callback. And there may be a second callback. And they may put you on hold, which means you know, you're one of the final contenders. It's usually you and one other person. As you start going through this process, you can't help but get your hopes up every single step of the way. And as, you, and as you get closer and closer and closer, this dealing with rejection gets harder. 
I mean, I'm very good about it on the first audition, about doing it and forgetting about it. Uh, but when you go through the process, it can be challenging. I mean, there was a job a couple years ago. Um, I, I was up for a, a guest star part on an episode of Speechless, which was a sitcom starring Minnie Driver. And uh, I got put on hold and it was like, oh, this was going to be so great. I did not get the job, obviously. I went to the other guy. And so that's kind of heartbreaking because, you know, to get that close to something that big, it's like, when does that, that doesn't happen that often, at least from the current position I am in the industry with my current, you know, representation, and my current level of experience. I mean, maybe in the future it'll be a little better and I'll have more opportunities like that, but, but it can be heartbreaking. But accept it up front. Know that it's there so that it doesn't become the primary issue. I mean, trust me, there's other things that you've got to deal with. Um, I mean, to name just a couple, there's a lot of factors that are outside of your control and you have to learn to accept that. The importance of connections cannot be underestimated in this industry. So if you're an unknown actor and you start off and you don't have any connections or nepotism to help you get started, you're going to face an uphill battle. It's going to be hard. You know, the, the top tier agencies are not going to see you. You, know, you can't just call up CAA or UTA or William Morris and get a meeting with them. That's not going to happen. I mean, to get to that level, you've got to go through a lot. I mean, typically you have to be already be a successful actor and then CAA wants you, right? But how do you get to be a successful actor? How do you get those jobs? I mean, it becomes this, this horrible, vicious circle. And to give you, you know, a little insider lowdown on this, this comes from a very reliable source. 100% reliable source. Certain network and studio casting directors will only see clients, actors, from certain agencies. So if you're not repped by you know, a top tier or a mid tier or above agency, they will not see you for an audition. So how do you get into one of those agencies? Million dollar question, right? How do you get in there? It's like a catch 22. Well, so I need to be a series regular to audition for this part that's a series regular? Okay, well, how did I get the first one? So it's, it, it's almost this insurmountable problem about how does this work? And that's why if you dig deep enough on a lot of successful actors, not all, but a lot of successful actors, is you'll, if you dig deep enough, you'll find the connection. Someone who helped them, someone who got them in the door, Someone who got them a seat at the table, at least. And, and, and it, it, from my, this. so no, you're you, Kevin. You're always more important than mindset. <laughs> oh no, no. I'm just saying it's, it's it's that's what I'm you know kind of striving for is to get that seat at that table, and it's 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 really hard. And I've I've been in the business for uh, almost eight or nine years, and I've got a, a big resume. Um, a lot of it's low budget, independent, certainly, but I've done over two hundred projects. Wow. So I've, I've got training, I've got experience, I've got a resume, I've got demo reels, I've got headshots, I've got an agent, I've got a manager, I've got all of these things, but it's still, how do I get a seat at the right table? I mean, you know, as an example, and, and this is hypothetical, because I, I can't state this as 100% fact, but if you wanted to be in Game of Thrones, not everybody could audition for Game of Thrones, I'm certain. I'm, just, I'm, I'm sure they only saw people from top tier agencies. So, so just because you know, you've got you know, a resume with a lot of credits on it doesn't mean you're going to get to audition for Game of Thrones because you've got to get at that table. How do you get at that table? It's like, I don't have the perfect answer to that, but I think you know, the best you can do is, you know, is try to make what connections you can. I mean, most of us don't have them, right? but you try to make connections and you will make more over time. So the, the best advice I really can give people is, and this also came from that 100% reliable source, is keep working, always work, and work towards getting a better agent. So view every single job as though, well, maybe that one is going to help me with the next step. So don't be that actor who you know is discouraged and sits at home and complains and, and don't be that actor who spends 100 percent of your time in class get out there and work you'll learn something from every single job that you do and who knows you may you might make a connection maybe you'll be in a project that'll be seen by a bigger audience i mean one of my most successful movies to use this as an example is is a movie called expelled 
which we shot in 2014, and it starred, stars Cameron Dallas, who's a big internet superstar. I play his dad. And this was done by Awesomeness. And at the time, Awesomeness did not have a presence in feature films. They do now, but they didn't back in 2014. And I booked the part in this movie, and um, I went to the table read. I had no idea who these people were, and these, these YouTubers, and, and Cameron was a Viner, if you remember Vine. And so I, I had no idea who Cameron Dallas was. And so I went home from the table read and I Googled and I'm like, oh my God, there are tens of millions of, of primarily girls and young women all over the world who love him. I mean, absolutely love him. And I, and I came out of that and I, I, I'm getting goosebumps right now, even as I say it. And it's like, you know, I think this movie's got the potential to, to break through. So we, we shot it and um, they had to get it released really fast. It went through post really fast. We got a limited theatrical release in the US for mainly for publicity, I think. We were in LA, New York, and Dallas. But we launched on iTunes a couple days later. And oh my God, this little movie, this relatively low budget independent, well, not independent, it was awesomeness, but relatively low budget awesomeness movie. We launched on iTunes and we were the number one best selling movie on iTunes across all genres, all categories, all movies. I still took a screen snap of this because I knew it was a rare once in a lifetime moment in time for me. We had knocked Guardians of the Galaxy into the number two position. I think the Maze Runner was number three. And so here's Expelled at the top of this list. And Expelled had legs. It stayed in the top five on iTunes, in the top 10 certainly for the first month. And then we moved to Netflix a couple months later and then we got a worldwide audience. And so suddenly this movie got seen by millions of people. So that's what I mean. I mean, this is a movie I got on my own through direct submission. I did not go through an agent. This was on LA Casting. At the time it was listed as a non-union movie. They flipped it to union. And I went in and auditioned for the director. I was the first one up that day, which a lot of people think is a jinx. You know, I'm the first actor he saw. I went in and I, I, I remember I was running late. I had lunch plans with another couple, my wife and I did. And then we're like, God, should I do this audition? We're gonna be late to lunch. And so I went, I went in and did it and then I kind of forgot about it. But the offer came a couple days later and look how the whole thing played out. So the point of this story really is this little movie, I had no idea what I was getting into. It got seen by a worldwide audience of millions of people. And now mind you, it didn't, you know, it didn't turn the adult actors in the movie into stars. I mean, the, the young people, Cameron in particular, in particular did very well. But it served me well. It's got a little star on my resume next to it. And I have booked jobs where people have, have said, oh yeah, you were an expelled. So it, it's, it's an example of one where it's, it's actually helped me. It's not like being in you know, the Avengers or anything like that. I'm not trying to pretend, <laughs> not trying to make it sound like more than it is. But from my perspective in my world, that was a very important movie for me to be in at that time. And so it did help me book other jobs. And so, you know, like I said earlier, you never know. So unless there's a real reason why you don't want to do that job, I say, you know, accept almost everything that comes along. I mean, every so often there's a red flag and there's something that's definitely wrong with it. <laughs> uh, there was one movie that I, I was offered uh, and they wanted me to, um, they wanted me to fall into a bathtub with my clothes on. It was a small part. A uh, one-day part. They wanted me to fall into a bathtub with my clothes on, and I thought, you know, I'm not a stunt man. Uh, I'm not 20. <laughs> I'm not as flexible as I used to be. Yeah? And I thought, you know, this. Uh, I think this. This was. This was a long time ago. I think this was a non-union movie. I thought, what if I hurt myself? You know, there's there's no workers' comp. I can't go to the union. I can't go to anybody. Suppose I sprain my my wrist or something. Suppose I, I, I bang my face and bruise my face and then I'm gonna be out of commission for a, a month or, or I thought, you know, there's, there's a red flag here. I'm just gonna turn that one down. So unless there's something like that, you know, I say do as much work as you can. I mean, there's certainly, like I say, exceptions where it's like, okay, no, no, that, one's, that, one's, that one sounds too awful. But, but I, I, I tend to do the majority of jobs that are offered to me, definitely. And talk about yourself again. I know that you do want to start your own production company, if I'm correct. What was the motivation yes. behind that? Well, it was kind of a turning point in my life and my wife's life. Um, my wife, Mary, had worked at 20th Century Fox, as I mentioned earlier. Um, she retired from the company in 2019. 
She had been a distribution executive for the majority of time there at Fox. She was the chief operating officer of international theatrical and worldwide home entertainment. So she had this great job where she, she overlapped with all divisions of the studio, including production, film and television, all functions of the studio, including legal and marketing, post-production, et cetera, et cetera. So she had this incredible background, this incredible skill set, and the perfect personality to be a producer. So when she retired from Fox, we kind of sat down and we said, well, okay, what's this next phase of our life going to be like? You know, we, we want to do something creative. We want to work together. We don't really know what, um, you know, what's the next chapter of our life going to be. Out of that discussion came the name of the company, which is Next Chapter Entertainment. So we sat down, we said, listen, what, what do we really want to do? And so we started with production. We wanted to do, and we want to do, low budget independent feature films. Now after that got rolling and we created our LLC, we ended up branching off into a couple other areas. We have, we have a publishing um, area where uh, we're now doing our first book. Um, we're actually almost done with it. It's, it's just been sent, uploaded to the, to the printing company. So my second book will be coming out soon. Just very quickly, it's called Thornsby by Fred McLaren, the complete comic collection. It's based on my dad's syndicated newspaper comic which ran in the 1970s here in the States and it was called Thornsby. So it's a labor of love project to, uh, to see my dad's work in print. So, so we've got uh, the publishing end and we've got our first project uh, almost done. And my wife is also doing talent management. So she's got a select group of clients that she's managing. So we've got three areas, um, but I'd say our primary focus is, is production. That's what we really want to do. Um, we want to have more control over the projects that we do. As I said earlier, being an actor for hire, you have no say in anything. It's, you come in and you do your job and um, you leave it to the powers that be about how it's going to end up. You keep your fingers crossed that you make it to the final edit. I was holding my breath with Lost in Space, trust me. It's like, please God, let me make it to the final edit. Thank God I did. Um, but you have to accept that as, as kind of a given. But, I'd love to do something where I have a little more control, a little more say so about how, how it's being done and when it's being done. And, and so I think my wife and I, you know, will be able to do something that we're passionate about. And we've, we've started, we've got um, some projects in development. There's two projects that we're actively circling. Uh, it's something I can't really talk about yet because it's not signed, sealed and delivered, but we've got two things that uh, are very promising for 2021. So. So we'll see where that leads. Um, it's, it's an exciting, you know, kind of change. Uh, it's a long process. It's a miracle when a movie gets made, let me tell you. There's so many, there's so many starts and stops. Um, but our philosophy here uh, at Next Chapter is, uh, you know, we're not going to crowdfund. Uh, nothing against people who do crowdfund. It's just not right for us. We believe to do the movies that we want to do, you have to have the project fully funded up front. Your, your full and correct budget needs to be in place. What is your strategy for acquiring those investors and funds for the movies? Right. How can they get out of that trap where they are relying on other people's money? And you probably won't yeah. be much if you are crowdfunding. It's, it's, it is a challenge. There's no doubt about that. So, you know, through your connections, you can, you can find people that, that are interested in financing. It's hard to, you know, I don't have an easy answer for how do you find those connections. Uh, I, my wife's been fortunate having worked at Fox that she knows a number of people. So there is a category that we can kind of draw on of people that are interested in investing, people who've invested in other projects perhaps, and one person leads to another person leads to another person. So you do have to kind of get into that circle where you're dealing with people who, um, who are interested in the movie business. Uh, the other side of that coin is you can... You can also finance the projects yourselves up front and take the risk and get the money on the back end through distribution. So, so those are, those are two paths that actually that Mary and I are, are pursuing uh, depending on what the project is. Um, it's, it's, it's an option to do that, but you know, on that second path, you know, once again, you've got to have, you know, good connections for distribution to kind of take that risk and get the money on the back end. Um, I have done, one of my very successful independents um, was, uh, and this movie did get worldwide distribution, so I think it's, it's, I'm sure it's in the UK. I know it's in Germany and Japan and a million other places. It's called All American Bikini Car Wash. And, um, and I think that was, 
I think that was a similar example where a lot of the, the stuff came on the back end through distribution. I, I don't know how, I can't speak to exactly how the movie was financed, but I know that, you know, they worked with, um, you know, uh, distribution channels and, and that's how they basically ended up, I think, all over the world was they kind of did it piece by piece, country by country, territory by territory. So if you're, you know, ambitious and motivated and got the contacts and want to do the effort, I think you can, you can get your indie out there in the world, but you've just got to recognize it's going to be one step at a time. There wasn't just one click for All American Bikini Car Wash. No, it had to build over time, but, but it did. And so, you know, I, that's a successful indie that, that does that. So I think for Mary and I, um, we're going to draw on all these, all these experiences. I mean, we're certainly going to draw on what Mary knows from her time at Fox and what I've learned my time as an actor and, and put it all on one big mixing bowl and um and hopefully avoid some of the pitfalls that that that, that you know crush other productions i mean from from my experience it's it's typically the budget you know that's what kills most people is that that's why a lot of movies just never get made is they can't get the money raised or they only get a limited amount of money being raised i've been in those indies where there's that limited cap and when you reach the cap like i was talking about earlier it's like okay we're out now, so there's nothing else we can do. And the movie may be too short, or maybe missing this scene, or maybe we too bad we didn't get more takes on that scene. It's like we're just out of money. So that's a hard, hard environment to work in. So I think with planning, we're going to try to avoid that. And um, and uh, and I know that uh, I can say with a fact that you know we have the money already set aside for what will be our first project. So. Um, we're, we're kind of off and running. We're, as I say, we've got two projects that we're kind of circling, but uh, if there's any screenwriters who are yeah, watching the podcast, I mean, we do encourage them to, to contact us. As long as they can work within you know, our parameters, um, um, we, you know, we'd love to hear from people because you know, we, we, we have a few kind of things that we like, but we've opened it up. I mean, originally we were going to do horror because we know horror is very marketable worldwide and we still hope to do horror. But we've kind of opened it up to the other genres, and so um, we'll see where it leads. Um, it'll be Thank interesting. You, I, I've always, I've always said that you know, uh, I, I never really would see myself as an acting teacher. It's not something I really aspire to do. But I do think I've, I've accumulated some knowledge um, that that is that can be useful to a young actor or a new actor because there's just a lot of things that you need to know and learn. Everybody wants your money. When you're in Los Angeles in particular, everybody wants you to take this class and get this coach and do these headshots and join this workshop and everybody wants your money. You've got to be smart with your time and your money. And there are a few pitfalls, things you need to avoid. And there's certain just helpful hints that you just need to know. I mean, if you walk into an audition ice cold and you've never had, you know, a cold reading or an, or an on-camera auditioning class, maybe you, you don't know, you know, don't bury your head in the script when the other guy's talking. I mean, that's a pitfall that a lot of people do at the very beginning. It's like they say their line, they're like, Whoosh, I said my line. And then while the other guy's talking, they're down there going. Tch, 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 tch. That's the worst thing you can do. You've got to listen to them. You've got to react to them. And then you can glance down and you've got to be able to pull it off the paper fast enough so you don't bury yourself down there. But you've got to react to the actors. Don't just be talk, 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 talk. Memorize, memorize, memorize. Talk, talk, talk. No, that's not how you do it. So there's, there's little things like that that, that that new actors need to know. And so it's, it's fun to talk about this stuff because it's more complicated than people think. Is there anything I haven't brought up that you'd like to say lastly? So um, I, I am also an author and uh, I was very fortunate uh, to do another creative project. This also kind of started around the time that I started acting. And I have a book that's out. It's called Styling the Stars, Lost Treasures from the 20th Century Fox Archive. My co-author on this book is Angela Cartwright, who your viewers will know from the original TV series, Lost in Space, and the feature films, The Sound of Music. Angela's a dear friend of mine. And she came to me with this idea, and it was perfect for me, perfect for, for us to, to collaborate on together. Styling the Stars is basically a movie book filled with old rare movie photographs from inside the 20th Century Fox archives. So it's a book for movie lovers. It's filled with 
rare, never before seen photos of all the great movie stars that worked at Fox from the 30s to the 70s. Our focus is primarily um, continuity and behind the scenes photos from the hair, makeup, and wardrobe departments. So you're seeing not your typical post publicity pictures of you know Clark Gable and Audrey Hepburn and Marilyn Monroe and John Wayne and those people. You're seeing them in much more candid moments, you know, with the clapboard, you know, getting their wardrobe shot taken. It's, they're just really fun pictures if you're a movie geek like me. And we're very, very proud of this book. It's, it's available in hardcover and softcover. The hardcover is almost completely sold out. It's done so well. Um, both versions have done very well, and, but they're both still available everywhere. And it's, uh, it's just been uh, a project that uh, was a joy to be a part of. Absolutely. I'm so that sounds amazing. It was a pleasure talking to you, Tom. I, it was one of my favorite podcasts. Oh, thank you so much. It, yeah, I, I loved talking with you. Like I say, we, you and I, I know you and I could talk for hours and hours and hours and it would just be a, a fun thing to do. 